June's body was found by a woman on her morning walk. The state police were contacted, followed by the deputy coroner. Deputy coroner Paul Vuxta observed a lady wearing light blue sweatpants and a gray shirt with a bib apron lying on her back with her arms over her head downstream with the current. He added there was coagulated blood from her nose and her head that was still flowing with the water. At 10.40 a.m., June was pulled from the water. She was declared dead and identified by County Detective Terry Knoll. Detective Knoll identified June on site as he recognized her from the Mini Mart where he bought coffee every morning. Spots abandoned his original plan, which was to flee to Florida, deciding instead to flee to Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Christina Noland was under heavy fire by Spots' attorney and the court during the pre-consolidation hearing, which was to determine if Spots and Noland should be tried together. Noland would testify that she and Spots did not speak during the four-hour drive to Rehoboth Beach. She stated the pair stopped at a Wendy's restaurant on the way to Delaware, where Noland went into the restaurant and Spots went through the drive through during trial, Nolan was called on the fact that she had every opportunity to ask for help while inside the restaurant. She would have done this if she were afraid of Spots, as she claimed. So said Spots' attorney and the judge hearing the case. There would be testimony from Linda Sheardon that Nolan told her the two walked hand in hand along the beach and there was talk of a quick marriage on the boardwalk. Nolan sat in the wet sand as the cold ocean air swirled around them and wrote Mark and Chris, 1995, Natural Born Killers in the sand. As harmful as this testimony was, and although it was probably not entirely true, Linda Sheardon had her reasons for lying since she was Spots' friend, not Nolan's. Christina Nolan did not dispute any of the above testimony. When Spots was apprehended 48 hours later, police found in his possession a date book with natural born killers written across one page in Nolan's handwriting. In the same book, they also found a tally Spots kept regarding the money and property he had acquired. On the bottom of the tally was a sentence in Spots' handwriting, a good day's work. Spots and Nolan then decided to head west to Maryland, running blind at that point. They stopped at a supermarket and bought antibacterial gel and surgical tape, chips, and water. Then at a gas station, bought razors, shaving cream, and a sewing kit. Blonde hair dye and scissors for Nolan's hair were purchased at a pharmacy. Nolan and Spots used the bathrooms at a Texaco station. Spots shaved and Nolan cut and dyed her hair. The two planned to cross the majestic Bay Bridge that spans the beautiful Chesapeake Bay, on their way to the entrance of the bridge, they were passed by several police cars, which was enough to spook Spots into returning to Pennsylvania. Spots and Nolan grabbed approximately two hours of sleep in the parking lot of St. Joseph's Hospital in Lancaster. Upon waking, Spots drove Route 30 heading toward York, becoming increasingly frustrated as there was no one around at the early hour. He knew they needed a car and Nolan would testify that at one point Spots yelled fuck it and stated he was going to get the next woman he saw. 5.30 a.m., 41-year-old Penny Gunnett had just stepped out of the shower and walked back into her bedroom to wake her husband. Tax season had begun, and Penny's hours were extended at the accounting firm where she was the office manager. Penny was known as a loving wife and mother, the type of woman who would take time to make a beautiful dress for her niece's doll as a Christmas present. The colors of the dress matched the colors of her niece's room. 6.20 a.m., Penny was stopped at an intersection. Spots pulled alongside of her 1992 Toyota. He rolled down the window to ask for directions, left his gun on the driver's seat, grabbed a map from the glove compartment, and exited the vehicle. Once out of the car, he threw the map back in, 
grabbed the gun off the seat and held the gun on Penny. He ordered her to move to the passenger seat. In Nolan's statement taken by state police, she described Penny as giving a little scream. Spots ordered Nolan to follow him in June Olinger's car, not realizing Nolan did not have her driver's license and never learned how to drive. Prior to coming across Penny Gunnett, Spots had assured Nolan that he was not going to hurt anyone else. His plan was to leave June Olinger's car and Penny Gunnett after robbing her of her car, jewelry, and cash. As Spots drove off with Penny Gunnett, Nolan tried her best to follow as Spots turned down Hoax Mill Road near Indian Rock Dam. As Spots sped down Indian Rock Dam Road, Penny remained contorted and twisted in the passenger seat of her own car. Nolan followed Spots as best she could. She caught up with him when he turned into a driveway that led to a barn. Nolan testified that she heard three gunshots, then upon seeing Spots' backup lights, attempted to back across the road, ending up in a ditch. She watched Spots as he sped off. installment of my documentary Spree Killer and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.